or so on the west coast here and it is um, 3 p.m in uh, new york city and um uh we like to joke here in oregon uh, we can tell the winter's coming because the uh, drizzle is getting cooler and uh, i hope the weather's great wherever you were uh today <clears throat> so I was on the phone earlier today with one of our partners in New York City, and I asked her uh, what the Christmas season was like there in New York. I expected to hear some sort of, um, oh, maybe hardened New Yorker type of attitude, like uh, people are grumpy and the, it's uh, cold and it's um, slushy or whatever. Anyway, she was very positive about the whole Christmas season. It was one of her, it's her favorite time of year, and she says the people there are friendlier, uh, they have um, a smile on their face and a warmth in their heart. And uh, she said a real change comes over the city. So that was really heartwarming to hear, knowing that um, it's not all bah humbug and what we might think about the big city where everybody's, everybody is bustling and scurrying around hard trying to get things done. But I hope things are great where you are. We've got a lot of questions today and a lot of things to get through. Let's go ahead and do that. Well, it's the end of the year, and we've done, I think, eight of these uh, type of uh, get-togethers. Um, so it's been wonderful to be able to reach out and uh, talk to a few people, if only remotely. And uh, some of the things we've been doing here in Best Places, uh, this is our last one of the year. And when we talk to you again, it will be right at the beginning of 2017. I can't believe it's already going to be 2017. It seems like it's far in the future, but it's, it's actually right around the corner. So what we did this year, we did things like uh, we worked for Rock Cosmetics. Uh, you women folk out there know about ROC. It's a French um, cosmetics company, Rock Cosmetics. Uh, and they wanted our help. This is the third year we've worked with them on the wrinkle ranking. The wrinkle ranking helps um, show which areas of the country are more at risk of premature wrinkles. And so you want to go to our website to see that. That was pretty interesting because we actually look into the future to see what is uh, more likely as far as weather changes, population, um, demographics, and which places are going to be more at risk. We also uh, did for the 11th year the Trojan Sexual Health Report Card. And this is a really important um, study that we do, we're very proud to do it. And basically we look at the 140 largest college campuses around the country. And by doing so, we look at the places which are providing the most information, resources, programs to help kids make their own best decision when it comes to sexual activity and how to be safe, how to be smart, and how to be respectful. So we look at the programs there, we rate all the colleges, that covers over 30% of all undergraduates in the US, hundreds of thousands of kids. And it's a very important thing. We're very happy to partner with Trojan to do this. They provide the resources for us to do it and it provides a lot of public good. Very happy to do that. Again, that's on our website, bestplaces.net. Check it out and you can see how your school is done. Um, by the way, my alma mater, Oregon State University, has done very well, so I'm very proud of that. So, go Beavers. <laughs> um, uh, we also did something for Fridays. Fridays, TGI Fridays uh, is a, um, oh, what would you call it, sort of a uh, chain uh, bistro lunch place. And um, they wanted us to find the places in the country where people had the most fear of lunching out, FOLO they called it. Instead of YOLO, they called it FOLO. So it's sort of a failure to, to lunch kind of thing. So where were people afraid to go to lunch because they had too much work? Um, maybe they, they, they didn't feel comfortable taking um, a lunch break. They ate at their keyboard. And you can look at the results on our site. They're very interesting see where your city is because your city might be one of the ones that uh, where people are working the hardest and enjoying lunch the least. And if we have time at the end of this broadcast, I'll go through some of the places and some of the surround surprising findings that we found. 
Uh, we also did some studies uh, like cost of living study. We did a custom one for University of Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, that was uh, pretty interesting. We compared um, UNLV with peer institutions around the country. And we've done the same thing for MIT. And that was pretty interesting. We're happy to use our resources to do custom work like that. So um, we're constantly looking for ways to make best places better and even more useful. So if you have suggestions, we'd love to know what your thoughts are and what you'd like to see and what would be useful. Um, so anyway, we are having a huge amount of mobile traffic on our website. Our website has grown significantly, about 20 to 25% over this time last year. Thanks to folks like yourself, I think that's wonderful. And uh, we really want to keep it a free site so you can get all the information you need to make some really smart decisions. Um, mobile traffic, as I mentioned, is nearly half of our site, maybe even over half. And that is certainly what the rest of the world is seeing. It's sort of more challenging to try and put all the information we have on our site in an accessible mobile platform. And coming up, we will have a mobile app, which will be really interesting. It's going to be something like the site, but it's going to do some completely unique functionality, taking advantage of the mobile platform and what you'd most like to see when you're using a mobile device. So it's going to be easy to use. It's going to be powerful. And it's going to be very, very useful. So uh, look for that to come in January. And if you're interested in testing it out, shoot me an email and we'll get you on the beta test list. Thanks. And that will be for both Android and iPhone devices as well. So on our team here, I just want to go ahead and give a shout out. We have some amazing people I have not given enough credit for, uh, enough credit to for all the wonderful work that they've done. Dana Bridges has been with us for two years. Uh, Dana is uh, living in Bend, Oregon. She's lived all over. And we have some questions coming up uh, this um, in this segment about places around South America. Dana has lived down there, spent significant time. Maybe she can chime in with some of this and answer some, of, give me uh, some of the answers for uh, us to talk about later. But uh, Dana is a great resource. She does amazing uh, work on our website. She's a UI UX, which is user interface and user, inter uh, user interface kind of person and user design. So she makes it look pretty and she makes it look usable. And that's something that we've really needed. And uh, she's done a great job. She's worked for places like Zenga, Yahoo, uh, LinkedIn, I believe. And um, I forget, some other site, uh, some big boy sites. And uh, we're really happy to have her expertise and her leadership here with us. We also have Al Olson. Al is uh, an amazing, he's a developer. Uh, he's worked for large firms like Nautilus and 800.com in their um, web servers and their websites. He's brought our ex his expertise over to us, and uh, he's keeping our site running and uh, doing some amazing work this year, transitioning, transitioning it over from the servers that we had to a new hosted platform. It's semi in the cloud. Uh, it's much more powerful than it was before and much more positioned better position to grow into the future. So he's making that work. Uh, Al Olson uh, is our guy over in that. He's in Vancouver, Washington. And we have Nick Arnold. Uh, he's our cart cartographer, geographer, uh, also getting involved in weather and climate. Um, he's done some remarkable work on the maps and providing his scientific knowledge. He's a product of Oregon State University and Frostburg State. Uh, which is in Maryland, and uh, so um, he's uh, really added a lot to the site. Uh, we also have Bertrand, my son Bertrand, and my other son Ted Sperling. Uh, they're down in LA. They have an office down there, and uh, they um, have added so much to the site, uh, brought a lot of uh, really energetic, useful ideas uh, to what we're doing and the management and the design. And finally, my wife Gretchen, who has been constantly encouraging, 
uh, as I go off on this crazy adventure. I've been doing this now for over 30 years. And without her support and guidance uh, and insights, um, this would not have happened. So I'm really, really a very lucky person. Uh, so thank you, honey. Thanks, Gretchen. So, um, and oh, I forgot Mike Kehoe. Mike is located over um, in, if you, where is that place? Uh, Clifton Forge, Virginia, which is uh, in the DC area in Virginia. And uh, Mike is a, um, uh, he's a business ninja who uh, is able to um, do a lot of the advertising deals that we have on the site that we try and keep enough money coming in so we can pay everybody and keep business going and still be inobtrusive in enough uh, so it'll be an enjoyable experience for you. So thanks, Mike, for all of your work. Um, so that's our team. And um, oh, we also have Jason Stoyles in New York City. Jason is working on our mobile app. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what Jason is going to do with all the information we're pushing his way. And uh, some of the, the products that we've seen from Jason have been remarkable. And I know that this Best Places app is going to be uh, a really a powerful, useful, and fun thing to use. So I'm looking forward to from that from Jason. So best you in uh, Long Island, Jason. So um, let's see. Let's get to some questions right now because it's a little, uh, we've been talking for about 10 minutes. And let's go ahead and see. Um, well, let's see. We have one here from Linda. Uh, she and her husband are retiring in May coming up. They live in Carson City, Nevada. They're both musicians and would like to retire someplace. We can continue doing some of our music as well as getting more for their money. And boy, I, I, that's certainly what people want. They will not have a large retirement to draw, draw from. Um, who will? <laughs> I, I know, I know uh, I'm not, and I, a lot of people are in the, in the position. It'd be nice to have a large retirement, but that is uh, tough to come by. They'd like to stay in the West, but they're willing to go towards the east. Also, is there somewhere uh, there's little or preferably no tornadoes? Well, let's go start with the little or no, no tornadoes. Basically, Linda, um, if you go towards the, if you stay out west, there's not going to be many tornadoes. Anything west of the Continental Divide uh, in the, you know, from the Rocky Mountains westward, not going to be a lot. There are a few odd ones. Uh, we were just in Manzanita, Oregon, on the Oregon coast, and we saw that um, the damage caused by uh, a tornado that struck, struck. I think it was an EF2. Uh, it ripped up some houses. But a tornado on the Oregon coast is a once in a hundred year event. But they will occur anywhere. And there was a couple of deaths uh, here in the Northwest from a tornado. I think back in 1972 or so. So they will appear anywhere, but certainly not common like they are in places in Oklahoma and such like that. So uh, if you stay out west here, you won't have to worry about that. But you said you'd like to go ahead and um, get more for your money. Well, California is going to be pretty well out unless you are in central California. Well, here's the thing. If you want to have an other musicians and an audience for your music, you're going to have to have a larger place, uh, a larger metro area or whatever you can draw from so that people can enjoy your music. Um, also, but that means it's going to be more expensive. So what I would suggest is look on the outskirts. What I'm finding is that People, the, sort of the creative artists, I like to play music, and uh, my musician friends that are uh, very serious about it and try and make a go of playing music professionally, they are having to live further out of town. Uh, so what happens is you can't really live in town because that's all very desirable and people are going to uh, bid up the prices on places in town. So you're gonna have to move out of the area and then you still have the metro area that you can travel into, say, maybe 20, 30 minutes. So you can have the venues 
and other musicians to play with too because um, a lot of times you want to play with other people if not for shows then just uh, to have fun and to share ideas so uh, Boise Idaho I think is a great place out west here um, and the Arizona area is coming back from a housing recession uh, it got hit hard and it's coming back so it is going to be more affordable than say places California Oregon and Washington the large metro areas um, well you might look at uh, for instance Portland is becoming pretty much unaffordable now it's been discovered Salem Oregon uh, considerably less so and basically the further you move away from the larger metro areas the more affordable it's going to be uh, Olympia Washington is quite a, sort of halfway between Seattle and Portland that's going to be pretty affordable Tacoma used to be sort of a gritty a gritty sort of poor cousin to Seattle and uh, it was kind of run down and as a result it was affordable but it's been discovered and uh, it's getting rapidly more expensive so again a little further south is Olympia you have Salem here in Oregon uh, you get north of San Francisco but then you're going to be missing out on a lot of the audience you might want so anyway those are some general thoughts I would take a look at Boise um, I was just there visiting last year uh, and that was really a very nice place and very dynamic too um, let's see what else we have um, Uh, Jake Wilson, uh, who is a program director for Transform Rockford. This is Rockford, Illinois. It's about an hour and 15 minutes uh, sort of southwest or west of the Chicago area, or Chicago land, as they like to call it. Um, he said, hope all is well. Not sure if you saw that Rockford made a good indicators lift list. It's number six on the fastest growing housing markets in the U.S., Good things are happening in our corner of the world. That's cool. Um, uh, this appeared in 24-7 Wall Street in a special report uh, on August 16th. And he said, uh, our community strategic plan was launched in November. We have a roadmap and have begun our project implementation step. How can small and medium-sized cities attract millennials who are looking for more urban, big city experience? Okay, that's a good question. Here's what I'm finding, Jake, is that people, there are new economic realities. Places continue to get more expensive. And they're, <clears throat> the popular cities are becoming more popular and they are becoming less affordable. And what's happening is a lot of people are moving away. For instance, San Francisco. Um, is becoming completely unaffordable for anyone <clears throat> with a normal salary. They're having to move away. In fact, they might work for a Silicon Valley firm, but they're gonna move to a place, maybe Portland or somewhere else, and they're going to telecommute and um, go to the city or go to their home base, their home office, maybe once a month, once every couple of weeks, something like that. <clears throat> I'm seeing this happening more and more. There's a lot of people here in the Portland area, Portland, Oregon, that are transplants from the Bay Area, and they're working remotely. So this is an interesting thing that we're seeing, and I think it's because they're getting forced out of places like um, San, San Jose and Palo Alto. Oh, I also saw an article in the New York Times. Uh, people are moving out of the uh, Bay Area, getting forced out. Companies are getting forced out and they're putting in satellite offices or headquarters even in the Phoenix area. Now it's a different culture. Uh, there's sort of the liberal culture, the blue state culture uh, of San Francisco, which is one of the most maybe liberal places in the US. And then you go to Phoenix where people openly carry firearms uh, on their belt. And that is kind of freaky for some people. <laughs> I know when we, um, we took a trip through the deep south last year, 10,000 mile road trip, and we'd be eating in a Waffle House and some guy would come in and there'd be a nine millimeter on the guy's hip 
a few inches away from me and uh, uh, being a, um, a person where that normally doesn't happen. Where we live, that doesn't normally happen. So it's uh, kind of an eye-opening uh, reality check uh, to how things are in different parts of the country. So uh, what I would suggest is, um, in fact, anybody listening, and what we tell people is that there are amazing opportunities in places like Rockford, Illinois. These are places where you can be an urban pioneer. It wasn't easy to be a pioneer. It was, it was an adventure. It was a challenge. And in some places, it's going to be, you're going to basically um, be part of that challenge and you can save yourself a lot of money and you can sort of remake your future in a much more creative way if you had to be struggling for a salary much more in other parts of the country. Uh, when I visited Rockford, Illinois a couple of years ago, I was really impressed by some of the creative people that I met that are making a difference that chose to be there because of its affordability and because of its um, dynamic attitude. And the mayor I found was really interesting too. He said, I could have stayed in Chicago. I could have stayed in Chicago and um, had a job, but I came back, he was a Rockford native. I came back to Rockford to try and make a difference. And I know that I can really have an impact here in Rockford where I couldn't have it in a larger city. So I think there's a lot to be said for that. And also, people these days much more want to move into the inner city. So much of the inner city is getting priced out. Uh, lofts are being developed, uh, infrastructure is there, and the prices are getting out of hand. The inner city and the infrastructure in places like Rockford and other cities that are um, in the Midwest, uh, that have been industrial towns, that infrastructure is there and there's a lot, uh, it's really affordable. In fact, um, what you could spend on rent, you could be buying an entire building in some of these towns and make it your own and make your own life there. So for a young, a young person or any person with a lot of energy and ideas, I think it's a great opportunity and everyone should give it a try and see if it's a fit for you. It's not a fit for everyone, um, but for many people, it's an opportunity to take control of your future uh, because you couldn't do that when you're just working all your, spending all your time in a job trying to earn money to pay rent uh, at other places that are less affordable. So Rockford, Illinois, uh, I think it has a lot to offer, a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunity. It's one of our opportunity cities that we highlighted for an article in Forbes. We're very proud of that article. And um, so you might check that out. Forbes magazine, Opportunity Cities. Let's see what else we have. Um, Uh, let's see, Mark P says, how about mentioning something like car taxes in some states? The Arizona tax structure looks really good compared with some states until you calculate your vehicle license tax on a late model car. They use the base price without options times 60% to come up with the assessed value. In his case, he's got a Chevy High Country truck uh, with all the options and his tax would be over $700 for this year and it appears like an annual tax. It drops to 16 and a quarter percent each year thereafter. So it's not a deal breaker, but if he has several vehicles, it might be. Now, that's a good question. Um, we don't have that on our site as far as vehicle license taxes, at least per state. That would be a great idea. We're thinking of having a state by state feature, which might be really interesting. In other words, it compares state level things that, um, for instance, uh, marijuana uh, legislation. That might be interesting to find out uh, which ones, uh, which states have legalized that state by state. Also, perhaps um, firearm registrations, uh, voting, uh, whether a state is a red state or a blue state. So the things at the state level we can do, and we can put those all in one chart comparing each state against each other. And I can see, Mark, that uh, the vehicle license tax might be really interesting too. 
but I'll tell you, there's a really good resource that I like to use. Let me let let me let you in on the secret, and that is it's from the Washington D.C. Um, city, or the their chief financial officer puts out a tax survey, and basically they look all at all the states and they figure out the differences and how expensive it is to live in each of the states, and they've chosen the the I think the capital city of each state. So um, uh, whatever, in, in different places, there would be a certain uh, city singled out and they would show all the taxes with that. And they look at the tax impact and then they compare that with Washington DC. So I think it's a lot of useful information. So it's from the chief financial officer, Washington DC and um, it's uh, basically a PDF that you can download and tells you all about the different uh, taxes and how they compare from state to state. Very useful. And I think that's something we should put on our website as well. So let's see what else we've got here. <clears throat> um, PF says, I have limited time, funds, and energy. Boy, been reading my mail, PF. Um, how do I organize the plan for, quote, the big search for what will probably and hopefully be the last place I live? It seems daunting even when moving close from state to state or within the city or from one county to another. And uh, it hasn't been a day in the park just thinking about this. So how to navigate locally without spending a fortune? I don't want to rent for the rest of my life. Are there a list of builders or communities that are willing to zone for nice communities that allow very small or not tiny homes, but not tiny homes? Well, th this is a real movement. You've probably seen uh, on television, on reality TV, where they have some of the folks um, where they have tiny homes and that sort of thing. What they often don't tell you is that there are real impediments uh, with local ordinances against building tiny homes. So while they seem attractive and they seem affordable and they seem like they're going to be fun, they're often uh, the zoning legislation has not caught up with what people want to be able to um, live in. So that's a problem. Now I've looked, unfortunately there isn't an overall uh, database of the places that are allowing tiny homes or smaller homes. So it's almost, you have to check on an individual basis and they're changing pretty quite fast. So you're gonna to have to check uh, frequently to see what the latest things are. And uh, PF goes on, um, let's see. Do I have any specific ideas beyond Airbnb local paper uh, for my search? I need to plan to keep costs to a minimum while searching. Uh, that might take me into my 90s for the next 30 years. He wants some roots, or he or she wants some, some roots. So, uh, PF, um, well, that's a good question. I was gonna mention Airbnb or one of these. That's a great way to live somewhere inexpensively, uh, to rent a place and in the middle of a neighborhood to see whether or not it's right for you. But, you know, there are even cheaper options available than Airbnb. They're sort of a couch surfing, uh, website. I don't know. I'm sorry. I have, don't know the name of it. Uh, if I was 18 years old and uh, uh, maybe uh, about to go to college or dropped out of college for a while and wanted to go couch surfing, there are places where you can just sort of hang out at people's homes for a few bucks. Um, if you look on the, uh, use Google to look up those places, you'll probably find them. And uh, um, send me an email. I'd be interested to know what you find and uh, and maybe share it with other people as well. So that'll be, uh, there are other alternatives and uh, today, uh, in today's internet sort of lifestyle uh, and it's a lot more freewheeling than it used to be, Airbnb is uh, actually pretty um, um, much of a standard now and it's almost uh, almost corporate by comparison to some of these places where you can um, find people uh, to hang out with and uh, help them out with their living expenses. And um, that's for the adventurous as well, of course, but you do, you do save a bunch of money. Um, 
I would also check, uh, yeah, check local newspapers. You can check all those online. You know, you can also tune into local radio stations. That gives you a flavor of what's happening in a place. And if those people are like-minded people like yourself, one last thing is meetup.com, M-E-E-T-U-P.com, meetup.com. That has a list and information about all of these gatherings that are all over the world in the United States and what people are doing. And you probably have some hobbies, some things that you like to do. That can help you find those people. You could talk to them directly uh, and learn about what sort of activities are going on. So let's see what else we've got. And the time is, oh, let's see, it's past the 30 minute mark. We are, um, okay, here's a good one. Amy says, hi, Bert, I have severe outdoor allergies. I've lived in many different areas of the country. Only in Phoenix did I get relief, but it's so hot there. I live in Portland, Oregon now and really need to leave. Any suggestions besides Phoenix? I need low cost living and a good job market. Okay, um, good question. You know, some people are really affected by, al by certain allergens and other people are not. There's actually, I think, four different types of allergens. There's a grass seed, there's ragweed, there are tree pollens, and then there are molds and spores. So what happens is some people are very allergic to a specific type or one or two of them. For instance, in the Willamette Valley, uh, Amy says she's in the Portland area, there's grass seed. It's the grass seed capital of pretty much the world. They grow grass seed all the time in the Willamette Valley. And I know some people who are devastated by that. I know one guy uh, who goes to the office <laughs> basically in, um, oh, I don't know, uh, about May and doesn't come out till the end of June <laughs> because it's air conditioned and he tries to spend as much time there as possible uh, to try and get some relief. So, um, it depends on your type of allergen that you're most sensitive to. Uh, so you said Phoenix, it is hot, but Prescott, Arizona is a town about an hour, hour and a half outside, and it's up higher up in the hills, about 5,000 foot altitude, I believe. And it is popular as a retirement destination, uh, in part because uh, I've been talking about it for quite a bit, uh, but it has a much more um, cl uh, climate, much more pleasurable climate than uh, Phoenix does. <clears throat> and in fact, I heard an in interesting story. This is this was someone told me who is a sixth generation resident of Phoenix. I, I didn't even know that it went back that far. But he told me that this is an interesting story I have not heard anywhere else. So I'd like to share it with you. What he said was back in the, say, 19, early 1900s or 1800s, before they even had air conditioning, uh, that came around maybe 1920, 1930, it was so hot in Phoenix that people had to, had to escape the heat. So in the summertime, the women and children would leave town and go up uh, into the hills, uh, places, cities in the hills like Prescott, Arizona, and uh, leave the men behind to work. Well, to work, and it became a party town. It became a wild, wild scene in Phoenix uh, in, uh, when, during the summertime when, every, when all the women and kids left. So um, I'd like to see the, a story made or written about that at some point, maybe a movie, it'd be pretty interesting. But uh, the entire town changed uh, when it got hot in more ways than one. Um, now, speaking of that, um, climate. We have, we've gotten some comments about this. In fact, we got one, uh, a comment from, I spoke to, um, I think it was Skip. Boy, I've got so many questions here, I'm having a hard time navigating them. But I think it was Skip in Mineral Wells, Texas. And Skip said that uh, he, was enjoying, uh, he's looking for a, um, a cattle ranch and he's using our climate index to find a place that would be right for him. 
we have a climate index or climate comfort index. And what we've done is um, evaluated the uh, summer temperatures and the um, humidity to find the places that are most comfortable. Now, what we had until we made a big change in our website, we changed a lot of things in our website. We just went through a big data update. So things are all fresh and new and shiny on our website. And one of the things we changed was we didn't make it just a summer comfort index. We made it a year round comfort index. And this has uh, confused um, and frustrated some people because they liked it the way it was. And it was uh, a really great comfort index for people and they learned what it meant. So, but they don't, but it's hard to go ahead and get a handle on year round comfort with just one index. For example, Portland and Miami might have much the same comfort index. And the reason is that Portland is flawed in some ways. It's kind of cool and drizzly and the sun doesn't shine much and the temperature can be cool at times. Miami is flawed in another way. It can get hot, sticky and uncomfortable for a large part of the year and some people can't take that yet you look at their comfort index and they're about the same and they really couldn't be further apart uh, in regards to their climate so one comfort index we've realized might not do the job for you so what we're doing is Nick our demographer geographer climate guy is uh, hard at work creating a new comfort index in fact a series of comfort indexes I think we're going to start with four for the four seasons and maybe even add a neat feature where you can dial in exactly how much snowfall, rainfall, cloudy days, temperature range, that sort of thing, and find then the places that are most important to you, uh, that are best suited for you uh, for climate and comfort. So look for that coming up on our site here in the next month, a new comfort index, series of comfort indexes, and you'll be able to see just what the summer versus winter versus spring and fall. Uh, I think it'll be a really great addition. And we're going to do that. It's interesting how we've done that. We've taken for all the weather sites in the US, thousands of them, we've taken the temperature, the high, low and medium temperature for every day of the year. So all 365 days of the year, we know what the temperature range is going to be or has been in the past. And what we've done is by measuring that, and the humidity as well over the course of the year uh, we have determined which days are within the 70 to 80 degree comfort range and if they vary much so they lose points for how much they vary and they're out of that range and then they gain points for the number of days they stay right in that pocket of perfect temperature and by the way best uh, climate in the u.s yeah probably hawaii san diego takes a close uh second and um, now some of the worst places, Mount Washington, um, I think New Hampshire, where uh, it's uh, on top of a mountain, there's a weather station up there. It has no days during the year where the temperature reaches between 70 and 80 degrees. And then you have the uh, 100 mile per hour winds which hit all the time. So it is a brutal place. So let's see what else we've got here. It is, um, 20 minutes till and uh, let's see let's see um, Tim says my partner and I of 35 years are in our 60s now and thinking of retirement would like to, congratulations Tim that's that's quite an accomplishment would like to concentrate on places that are LGBT friendly we know the usual suspects he says Fort Lauderdale Palm Springs most big cities but we're looking for a mid-sized to smallish place, but not so small that there's not good medical care. A few caveats, neither of us like hot weather, so that rules out lots of traditional places. I've heard good things about college towns like Northampton, Massachusetts, Ann Arbor, Madison, also Santa Fe and Asheville. Have we hit them all? Are there any hidden gems you can think of? Uh, wow, great question and a lot of ground to cover. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Um, so, one thing is LGBT friendly. A good place to go ahead and start is looking at maybe some of the state laws that give an indication of um, the level of inclusiveness, openness, and acceptance 
of um, diverse lifestyles. And I think, uh, so that's a good way. Also, talk to friends. Uh, the internet is pretty amazing uh, these days as far as getting information and talking to like-minded people as well in whatever um, interests and uh, lifestyle a person has. So that would be, I think, an important thing to do. I would hate to go ahead and point you just in some direction with something specific in mind like that and then find I'm wrong. That would be pretty devastating. But you know, one thing, Tim, I found is pretty interesting. Traveling around the US uh, last year through the Deep South, we found, and Gretchen and I, I did this, it was a great trip, took over a month and it was really a lot of fun. You really, I urge anyone to go ahead and do that to see more of the country. We have an amazing country out there and uh, there's so much to see. One thing I found was that you could go into some of these towns and sure, they would be very, very Southern, very sort of conservative or whatever, but right in the middle of that, there'd be a neighborhood. And in this neighborhood, all of a sudden you see, instead of pickup trucks, you might see Fiat's, Prius hybrids, um, oh, what are other sort of cool cars? Uh, maybe some BMWs, uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> And then you'll see uh, uh, sort of uh, hipster style pe folks with um, skinny jeans, um, corn rim glasses, uh, and maybe a, a, a cool bar or coffee shop nearby. So there'll be an enclave of like-minded people. And it hit me that this is a lot like folks, our ancestors perhaps, that came over from Europe, um, Let's see, my, uh, my grandparents came over from Norway and Sweden and ended up in New York City. And uh, just like folks landing in New York City, uh, Italians lived together, uh, Jews, Irish, Germans, they all lived together, Chinese, lived together as a community so they could go and better, they, had a, uh, they could better assimilate into the United States. So what happens is that we're traveling through the deep south and then there'd be these pockets of sort of uh, cool hipster neighborhoods around the US and it struck me that's like a lot like what happened in uh, New York City and other uh, port towns where immigrants came over where people um, cluster together uh, to have a common lifestyle and uh, it was more easy for them to be friends. So really, many places that you go around the country, this is becoming more and more common where you're going to see like-minded people clustering together. Now, there's also what people are finding too is that there, our country is actually getting more divided and segregated. This is a problem and I think this is, for instance, um, people are unaccepting of people that, uh, others that think differently than themselves politically or culturally. And uh, I think that sort of divides our country. Um, and that's an issue. But there are still places in many towns that are going to have folks that are very welcoming and accepting of different viewpoints. Um, so college towns, uh, get off the soapbox about that. So I'm sorry if I um, pontificated about that sort of thing. So let's say we have um, college towns. There are lots of college towns. College towns are a great place to think about for retirement. I just had, uh, was quoted in an article in the New York Times. You might look back about a week or two weeks, end of November, there was an article about some of the issues that people are finding when moving to a retirement place. It's not all roses. Um, there are challenges. And um, that article did a good job of talking about some of the things. And uh, yeah, Oxford, Mississippi is one that is commonly mentioned as a place that's affordable, uh, but a very, um, very cool college town. Um, Northampton, you mentioned, uh, yeah, that is a, uh, a nice place. Ann Arbor, Madison. Uh, we were just in Santa Fe and Asheville. 
Uh, Asheville was interesting. They People have referred to it as the San Francisco of the South, uh, meaning sort of a, a liberal cool bastion. Um, it didn't hit me that way as much as maybe I had expected to. Uh, but I, in fact, uh, a friend of my son's um, has recently moved from San Francisco to Asheville. And uh, I'm looking forward to sort of uh, interviewing him and finding out exactly what he finds about it and adding that information to my body of knowledge. Uh, so Asheville was pretty neat. But, uh, and San, Santa Fe was also pretty cool as well. Uh, that's something to think about. Uh, Santa Fe is a, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, of course, state capital. State capitals are always good too. What you want beyond just the cultural is economically, you want a stable place to live. If you don't have, if it's not stable economically, uh, funding is an issue, um, social services uh, suffer for the poor, the elderly, um, and for schools is a problem, and then basic city services like parks, roads, police, fire. So you want a place that's stable economically. College towns are stable. They're very stable, and state capitals are stable too. So I would go ahead and search for those places, uh, and, and or at least, if not search for them, at least give them a special, um, a special credit, uh, special attention in your search. So let's see um, what else we can go ahead and talk about. Let's see, someone said about, so I'm, I've got a couple of questions about living in um, South America or Central America. Boy, I, I'm afraid I would be a poor resource for you, and I don't want to lead you astray. So I've got one from Nicholas, and I think there's another one here. Um, Edgar, uh, who talks, uh, has asked about that, and I'm afraid I don't, I don't want to lead you astray. Uh, I can pass these on to Dana. She's our in-house expert on Central America and maybe she has some insights I can pass along to you. So if you, um, if I don't have your email address, send it to me, and then we can uh, go ahead and see if she has some uh, specific information about that. Um, uh, someone here, uh, Cliff, says that Tucson is a mystery to me. I moved here from Phoenix about 11 years ago. The weather is nicer here, and there's more natural beauty higher mountains and foothill areas around the city. It rains a lot more in the monsoon season. We get wonderful storms and it's less crowded. Yet, he said this is a very apathetic place, maybe the most apathetic I've been in my life. And it has not fared well coming out of the economic and housing recessions. And they're moving forward slowly. Um, and it's basically, he says it's isolated, and it just doesn't have much as far as resources. Uh, he wrote a very nice, uh, long description of some of the frustrations that he's had there. And he said, um, don't folks realize how far behind they are and what they're missing and what, uh, and what they're risking? It. When will they wake up? Gee, that's a good question. Uh, just sort of getting on my soapbox again. I, I find that, you know, from a personal standpoint, uh, if, <clears throat> if we as, if we're not as a nation or even personally if we're not risking if we're not failing we don't have any chance for success and so I've been uh, sort of bothered by our country where we have not been risking very much and any mistakes that are made are punished at the ballot box or wherever and um, I would like to see us take more risks realize that failure is okay venture capitals capitalists fail all the time, and uh, they manage to make a lot of money, <laughs> if that's the measure of success. And um, <clears throat> you have to risk to succeed. So hopefully we'll do that. So what is there about Tucson? Good question. Uh, it is a college town, uh, but the college is not a large part of the city. It does have some of the cleanest um, air in the United States for a larger city, and so there's that to recommend it. Um, but it is kind of remote. 
It's way, way removed. It's away from Phoenix, not that far, but from the rest of the country, yeah, it's very removed. I saw the same thing in El Paso, Texas. El Paso, El Paso is so far removed, it's even removed from Texas. Uh, it's way out there by New Mexico, and folks in El Paso sort of proudly regard themselves as being West Texas and different than the folks in Dallas, <clears throat> Austin, and the rest of Texas. Uh, but El Paso is a very cool place, and what I said about um, Rockford, Illinois, also holds for El Paso. I think it uh, has a lot going for it. The economy is coming back in El Paso. Uh, that was my main knock on it for quite a while, but I think it's uh, a great place to check out. But back to Tucson. Uh, Tucson, um, yeah, it is isolated, and they did have the huge housing recession, and it's going to come back a little bit slower because it doesn't have that strong um, sort of inherent economic base to come back to. So it is going to be uh, a little more problematical. So um, let's see. In fact, Dana uh, is online. If Dana would like to type in, uh, someone here is, hmm, was, um, someone has a question about Belize, Ecuador. Uh, or Belize or Ecuador, or both, are they safe places? Uh, they've read Belize City is especially dangerous, but the rest of the country is fine. So, Dana, if you have anything, you can write there on our little chat window and answer this uh, question from Sterling. Um, and I think someone also had a question about, uh, oh, um, Ecuador. Uh, <clears throat> Cuenca, Ecuador, and they also um, they had a question about San Jose in Costa Rica, and I think that's right up your alley, uh, Dana. I think you lived in um, uh, Costa Rica, so you could share any thoughts about uh, San Jose. While Dana's doing that, um, we have uh, someone who. Uh, wrote that after seeing Deerfield Beach, Florida on the top 25 of the most affordable U.S. beach towns, we researched it and are planning to do a pre-move visit there and hopefully relocate uh, once it's determined if I can stand the humidity. Deerfield Beach is by Boca Raton, right? And we chose it partly because we ha it has a mix of young and old, locals and tourists, which suits our professions well. Um, she's a marriage therapist, and my husband is a massage therapist. Uh, no specific question, but I was wondering if you have any advice about living in Florida uh, these days or Deerfield Beach specifically. I'm sorry, Maya, I didn't have time to research Deerfield Beach in particular, um, but Florida is coming back. Uh, it's coming back nicely from the housing crash, um, and it still has bargains to be had, which is good. So it hasn't completely recovered. It hasn't entered a boom phase yet, so there's not that danger, and there's still uh, bargains to be had. So given that, um, I would say one thing I would look out for is I saw an interesting article in the New York Times again about some of the dangers of buying property that's too close to the ocean. In fact, that when you look at prices for waterfront property or property that is near the water in uh, on the East Coast, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, prices have actually gone down uh, about 1% over the last five years as opposed to going up in other places that are better protected from flood zones <clears throat> and the uh, storm surges from hurricanes. So I would be careful of that. Um, you might pick up what seems like a real bargain, but not only is there the danger of flooding and there's the danger of storm surges, but uh, flood insurance can be really prohibitive. They're talking about uh, FEMA has gone and up their flood insurance from say $100 a month to as much as $1,000 a month, making it unaffordable in some cases for people, uh, normal people to afford a uh, 
a home near the beachfront. So be careful of that and look for the cost of the flood insurance and if that flood insurance is needed um, to finance the home. Because a lot of times, well, you might say, okay, I'll take my chances, I won't get flood insurance. But if you have a mortgage, they will probably make you have the flood insurance and then you're stuck. So look into that and um, be sure to go to Florida in July and August and uh, <clears throat> see what the humidity is like and um, maybe the uh, um, hurricanes as well. I spent some time growing up in Key West, Florida. It was pretty magic. Uh, I was, I don't know, what was I, eight years old? Uh, I could go snorkeling. I could pick spiny lobsters off the bottom of the ocean and uh, have them for dinner, uh, find big conch shells um, in the water. And the ones I found were mostly, I think I found one, I still have it, still have it at our beach place in Depot Bay. Uh, it had died already, so I, uh, nothing had to be sacrificed. And um, that was a magical time. So um, anyway, enjoy Florida. I know Bertrand also was uh, down there uh, visiting and doing some research down there. And it has a lot to go for it. And uh, a lot of the places are still affordable. So uh, I hope you can give us, uh, send us an email or whatever, or put comments on our site. Which reminds me, we're, we're getting close to um, uh, the end of the hour. You are the expert wherever you live. Nobody knows more about your little patch of land where you live than you do. And, you know, I know a lot of stuff about the country in general, but I don't know as much as you do. So if you could write and put a comment on our site, bestplaces.net, it has places for commenting and Dana and Al are completely revamping that uh, and it's really going to be even more useful and entertaining than it is right now. But give us your comment about what it's like to live where you are. You can go down to the zip code and tell us what it's like in the zip code or the city and tell us what the climate's like, the people. I'd love to know and I'd love to be able to share that with other people that are interested in uh, moving where you live and uh, learning more about it. So let's see if we go ahead and uh, have anything. No, I think uh, Dan is doing a great job answering some questions about um, South America, uh, about Central America. That's very cool. And maybe I can fit one, one more in. <clears throat> um, let's see. So we covered comfort indexes. Let's see what else we have here. Boy, I'm running out of time. Oh, this is interesting. So we have our fear of lunching out. This is our poll. Let's see how uh, what they have. Now, I don't have specific information about where you happen to live, but if you go to our website, your city or town, the large ones, we looked at, I think, the 50 largest metro areas in the U.S. Half of the people in the U.S. live there, so you'll probably be able to find out what's going on where you live. <clears throat> so this is our TGI Fridays Fear of Lunching Out online poll results. 64% of people bring their lunch from home and to eat at work. Um, do you take a lunch break during the workday? Over 58% uh, of the people do take a lunch break, but 42% don't even take any lunch break whatsoever. Ouch. How many times do you stay in the office to eat for lunch at your desk? And 33%, a third of all office workers stay in the office and eat at their desk every day of the work week. Only 20% never do it. And uh, then it's pretty well divided between people that do it two, three, or four times. That's about 14, 15%, 10%. Um, what most affects how often you eat lunch out while you're at work? Cost is the most important, 31% of the people. Convenience, 25%. And well, actually, the most important one is they don't have time to get away. So basically, they're too rushed at work, don't have time to get away. Over a third of the people, 34%, don't have time to get away. And um, how common is eating lunch out at your workplace? 30, 
oh, about 30, 40%, half of them um, eat out, uh, but a third of them rarely eat out. So anyway, our time's up. Uh, it was wonderful to spend some time with you. Thank you for letting me be a part of your day today. I hope you found something interesting. Please come to Sperling's Best Places at bestplaces.net. I'm Bert Sperling, and I hope you have a warm and wonderful, happy Christmas and a wonderful New Year, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever. I hope you have a wonderful time with your family and loved ones, and it's a magic time. So have a warm winter month in December, and we'll see you in January. Thanks very much. And I'm frozen. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs>